Well, let's start. Let's start by saying this. I'm going to repeat it later when we record it, but uh, I still want to. I want to use these words because uh, everybody else is listening very anxiously from uh, throughout the world. So we have uh, people watching in Brazil. We have people watching in America and from uh, almost every country in the world. There are almost a thousand Brazilians uh, registered for Acton University this year, and it's a pleasure to have you here. So I, I wanted to start by uh, remembering Roberto Campos, who you know, uh, or you knew very well now, the late Roberto Campos, who was a Brazilian liberal economist who graduated in philosophy and theology. And he said that he was quite commonly, uh, usually asked uh, the following question, is there a way out for Brazil? And he replied to this question by saying, there are three way ways out for Brazil, the airport of Sao Paulo, the airport of Rio de Janeiro, and liberalism. Uh, in these times of coronavirus virus pandemics and travel bans, I'm afraid that uh, we have to stick to the only way out, which is yes. liberalism, right, Certainly. Minister? <laughs> yeah. Certainly. Certainly. So I want to thank Acton for receiving so many Brazilians this year, as I told you. Um, and the defense of markets and the virtual society is growing very fast in Brazil. Uh, Mr. Paulo Guedes is, uh, got his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, was a professor at PUC Rio, Getúlio Vargas Foundation, and the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics. He's founder of Banco Pactual, Abril Educação, Faculdades IBMEC, and Instituto Milenio. He joined boards of directors of large companies and is today the Minister of the Economy of Brazil. So thank you very much, much Minister, for being with us here at Acton. And I would like to start by asking uh, the following question. Uh, you did not always have this point of view of being a classic economic liberal, right? So what were the most important influences on your economic philosophy uh, today? Well, I, I would say that I, I became liberal and more liberal over time uh, as I understood uh, the um, political implications uh, the social implications of dirigism, of the alternatives. Uh, as you know, the Enlightenment had, uh, the year of the Enlightenment had two great variants, uh, two diverse uh, brands. Uh, one was this Anglo-Saxon constitutionalist uh, based on markets, on, it's basically what we, we believe, we liberal Democrats believe, uh, democracy and markets and the moderate role of the government is exactly to, uh, uh, to, because we don't want people to be left behind. So we should give equal opportunities. We should help those that didn't have the same uh, starting point. Uh, and uh, the other variant, which is the continental one that inspired uh, the, uh, the, the French Revolution and later uh, the, the socialists uh, with the Russian Revolution. Uh, these guys gave more emphasis uh, to pretensely to ass their assumption was that uh, 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 equality and fraternity uh, should be uh, the, the target. And uh, the results were not good at all because uh, we had the socialist uh, experiments of Russia, of China. They were human disasters of huge proportions. All over Latin America, we had the same phenomena. Uh, we had the same wars and, 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 and uh, uh, lack of liberty, human liberty all over Africa. Uh, and uh, I think that today, upon reflection, uh, we understand that um, uh, the other tradition, the liberal tradition, uh, was conducive to what I call the Brazilian program, which is the road to prosperity, uh, which is a mix up of the road to serfdom of Hayek and uh, prosperity through competition of, of Ludwig Erhard, the other great liberal that fixed up Germany after war. So um, I, I would say that these two, these two, um, these two variants of the Enlightenment, one given emphasis on liberty and fraternity, and the other giving emphasis on equality 
and fraternity. Uh, I have no doubt about which one is more successful in terms of uh, human liberties, uh, 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 material uh, wealth, spiritual wealth, uh, uh, freedoms in general. Uh, so I think this is what I stand for. When I began, I was just a, a curious and uh, a, a curious. I had my great love, of course, after the people I love, my, my, my great intellectual love was economics before liberalism. So I began studying the, the classics, uh, Ricardo, Alfred Marshall, um, uh, Keynes himself, uh, reading these guys in, 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 in the, original, the original books and trying to dominate my field and following Karl Popper. Uh, much later, I understood I was a follower of Karl Popper when I understood that first you have to dominate or at least to accumulate the most you have, uh, if the most possible, in your knowledge field. So first economics. Then the second mission, according to us, the first mission of an intellectual is to dominate his very own field, to specialize. Uh, then you began reading uh, uh, the uh, fields that could cooperate to your understanding of your own field, which in the case of economics would be history, would be sociology, would be law. So you began searching around your field of knowledge. And the third mission of the intellectual is having this understanding of the world after long, long years of study to communicate in a very simple way with people in general. Uh, and when even asked it, I was a follower of Hayek, even in this line, which is, should you go to the government? His answer was always, no, you should keep writing and you should keep talking about it. You should... Because if you go to the government, you probably, uh, you, if, his idea that ideas change the world and not properly public officers or jobs in the public officer. Uh, so uh, I was a follower of Hayek, T.Y. I became almost 70 years old. So then I gave up just preaching and I came to practice to share my knowledge and experience uh, trying to improve my country. Uh, so my, I, I would say my great, I became liberal when I was, it's amazing, but I was at Chicago, which is the temple of economic freedom as far as the economic uh, tribe is concerned. We have, at the time I was there, we had like 20 of the 40 Nobel Prizes. And after that, they won even more prizes. When I was there, Friedman received the Nobel Prize when I was there. It was not a Nobel Prize at the time. Uh, then later, Becker, James Heckman. So it was uh, Sargent was my professor there. Uh, Bob Lucas was my professor there. So I had classes with at least eight Nobel Prizes. Uh, at the time, they were not. Uh, but it was a wonderful intellectual experience. But interestingly enough, because of the technique, mathematics, a lot of the liberal message was lost because you dominate technical uh, equipment and then you can make beautiful forecasts to, to simulate general equilibrium dynamics, stochastic models. You can do beautiful work that, as a matter of fact, distract your mind of your main message, which is how to better human condition. So you, you, you get distracted by the models and you lost the principal message. So when I got back to Brazil and I saw the mass, hyperinflation, poverty and all that, then you keep reading on the other fields. And, and then you get very close to the Austrians to von Mises, the socialists that were fighting von Mises and Hayek. And then you get, you, you get the historic knowledge that all these battles that we are fighting today, they were fought already. They were fought already in Austria when Austria was going down. And then Hayek himself moved to uh, Germany. 
and then they were fought there, not against the left, but against the right now. The, the, uh, before, first he was fighting against Marx and international socialism. The guys, the international socialist uh, tribe. Then when he flew to Germany, they were fighting against the national socialists, the Nazis, also totalist, totalitarian regimes, dirigist in economics, totalitarian in politics. So this is an eternal battle. Then you understand the battle of Sparta against Athenas and why the Greek went down when the totalitarians, Spartans, uh, dominated the peninsula uh, and Greece eventually. So these battles have been fought over time and they'll keep forever, I think. Uh, By the way, they, they will be continuing to be, to be fought. And uh, my, my, my question now straight to our situation in Brazil, Minister, um, how do you consider, or what do you consider to be the biggest obstacles to economic development in Brazil and Latin America more generally? Are the obstacles primarily economic, legal, or cultural? I think they are mainly cultural because the legal and the, and the economic obstacles are a decorance of your perception of the world, of your knowledge about all these battles. Uh, I think Brazil, uh, when I talked about those two variants, it, the same variants, if, if you get the, the, the common law of the British or the constitutional experience of the British with the British constitutionalists, uh, you see that the, uh, they, they are uh, the, the legacy of the, of the Anglo-Saxon tradition uh, so the Americans, America, uh, was kind of a, 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 a son or, uh, or they inherited the constitutionalist experience, the, the markets and I wouldn't say the democratic, the constitutional and the market experience of the British. So they were colonized by the British. Uh, the founding fathers were... Uh, a, a, a magnificent generation, very well read on history, on law, on the constitution and the rights and freedoms of the British people. So they, they use this very same arguments that were written in the constitution of the British. So they saw, they said, no taxation without representation. So the, the, this is what the people in the, the, the British uh, argued. Uh, to limit the power of the king in the Magna Carta. So uh, this was their inheritance, cultural inheritance. Uh, meanwhile, we Brazilians uh, and South Americans in general, we inherited uh, the other variant of the Enlightenment. So how could the, the nobles, the most noble uh, 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 ideals of the French Revolution derail into tyranny of the Jacobins and then tyranny and the Napoleonic Wars. Why did it happen? And the answer is already in Tocqueville. Tocqueville already in the Ancien Regime, L'Ancien Regime, the old uh, regime, uh, he already analyzed that and the diagnosis was the, the, the Hobbesian uh, state, the dirigist state, the centralized the centralization of power, political power, the centralization of resources. This is what derailed, made the very noble ideals of the French people to derail in a very bloody uh, 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 revolution. And later uh, on the Napoleonic Wars. And this was already diagnosed by Edmund Burke, another liberal, British, uh, contemporaneous of the revolution. So at the time the revolution was going on, Burke, a liberal, was already saying, well, I don't know where this thing is going uh, because it, it is too much of centralization, too much of dirigism, too much of force instead of uh, evolutionary view. I would say that the, the problem with the continental tradition 
was the revolutionary view instead of the evolutionary view. Liberals don't like revolutions. They like evolutions, institutional evolution, uh, institutional uh, perfecting of the, of the uh, uh, powers, uh, independent powers. So we are going through an experiment in Brazil, which, in, and this is the basis of my optimism. I don't think the image that they have abroad from what is going in Brazil is correct. I think Brazil is an open society in the making, in the making. We are in the making of a, an open society. Uh, in the last 30, 40 years, we went uh, all over the political spectrum of the left. And now we had a coalition of liberals and conservatives running the country. And there is a lot of noise. So just to finish, because the time is over for you guys and we could keep going with the interview. Uh, but uh, we prefer the noise of the democracy, which is what you are hearing abroad, than the silence of the a dictatorship. So we don't know how many uh, 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 people are contaminated by coronavirus in North Korea. We don't know exactly even what is going on in China. We don't know what is going on in Venezuela, how much people are infected, how, much, how many people are, being, uh, are dying. Uh, but you are hearing a lot of noise about Brazil, about powers uh, fighting against each other. But it's all inside the democratic rules, all inside the democratic rules. Roland Minister, we have good news. We can keep on with the, with, the, with the live event. We won't be recording later, so we can continue with the interview uh, in the scheduled time. And we thank very much the organization of, of Acton for providing us this extra time and the understanding of everybody who is participating. So, well, uh, good, finish, right? Just to finish yes. then the answer to your second question, uh, I think uh, the, the problem is basically cultural. But the good news is, when I had your age, we were five liberals in Brazil. Roberto Campos, the old guy, sponsoring uh, the youngers. Uh, it was me and two or three other economists. And, we, and that's all. Uh, I used to go to a university to, uh, as long as they announced it, Paulo Guedes, PhD, University of Chicago. I was booed by 5,000 people. And today, anywhere I go, I'm applauded by 5,000 people here and there and everywhere, liberals all over, and young guys like you coming to the Congress. So your generation will free Brazil from this intellectual trap. Thank you very much. So we hope and so we are working for it. I'm here at the National Congress, by the way, I didn't tell in the beginning, the uh, minister is here in Brazil, also at the ministry of uh, economics and we're doing our best also to, to, to push for the economical reforms that Brazil so badly me, uh, needs, Mr. Uh, Paulo Guedes. So my next question is, uh, what are your models for economic liberalization? If you look uh, abroad and you're a very knowledgeable uh, professor and economist, if you look at the outside experiences of liberalization, what would you say are the models that we could you know, uh, uh, take as example for our own country, for Brazil? Well, I think that historic experience and reading uh, gave us uh, uh, a diagnosis of what is going on in Brazil. So even though we moved from a politically closed system with the military to an open political system, we did not complete our transition our structural transition, which is to transform a de-regist regime. When the military came, they built our infrastructure. So you had lots of state companies like Telebras, Electrobras, Cedebras, Portobras, Nuclebras, all state companies producing an infrastructure. Uh, and democracy, over time, it happened in Brazil, what happened in the Soviet Union, what happened in China, what happened everywhere which is as long as you uh, are building dams, building roads, building some hydroelectric power, some very well-established technologies, uh, you can sustain 5%, 5.5%, 3.5% growth rates. But you do not have the essence, the essence of the open society, which is 
decentralized intelligence. What is a democracy? A decent, a, a, a political method of reaching uh, uh, political, a decentralized method of having political decisions. So you use, you do not concentrate power. Uh, a closed political system concentrate powers in one man, his cabinet, uh, three or, or five intellectuals, and so on. Uh, the essence of a democracy is the decentralization of political power with the people, with the nobles, in, 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 in the British experience, with the nobles and the, 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 the lords, and then the, the Chamber of Commons. Uh, but decentralizing political power that was just with the king previously. Uh, so the essence of a democratic system is the decentralization of political power. And the essence of a market economy is the decentralization of economic power. Intelligent decisions are taken decentralized and they create innovation, they create competition, they create prosperity. So what happened with politically closed or economically deregistered regimes over time, uh, we know already. It's exactly the experience analyzed by uh, Tocqueville. So when Tocqueville compared uh, what was going, and then he wrote another book uh, 30 years later, uh, Democracy in America. First he wrote the ancien regime and then Democracy in America or the other way around, I don't remember. I think he was first in America and wrote Democracy, uh, Democracy in America. Uh, uh, and then he wrote, uh, the ancien regime. Uh, but the thing is that if you read both books, you understand uh, the difference. Uh, why the French were with a lot of corruption, a lot of violence, and eventually they went to uh, the Napoleonic Wars after the Jacobin terror. And then you understand why the Americans were creating a great nation, a great nation, uh, because of this decentralization and limitation of state power. So. Uh, our diagnosis was exactly that uh, the concentration of political power and the, and the dirigist economy, they corrupted our democracy over the last 30 years and they stagnated the economy. So we had to complete the job. It's not just we pretty much like the Russians. Uh, we went first uh, for the political opening. Uh, they made the glasnost but they didn't make the Paris drug. So even Brazil, Brazil, like Russia, we went to hyperinflation, both of us. We went to moratorium in the debt. Uh, we went to, uh, uh, to the, to, we kept the concentration of political power. So people fear Putin and people fear Bolsonaro. Uh, but uh, so our challenge is, uh, it, it, our challenge is exactly to transform, to complete the transition. Uh, of the democratic system, which is exactly decentralizing uh, financial resources, economic power, political power, and opening up the economy and opening up to competition. So I would say that our historic lessons came from the US itself as compared with the French, uh, and they come more recently uh, with the rebuild of Germany in the after war, how to to, to Ludwig Erhard, he was a liberal. He fought very hard against the social democrats, which were, he, he left his book, Prosperity Through Competition. And when I read it, I see what is going on in Brazil, exactly like in Brazil, how the social democrats uh, using very uh, fraternal, fraternity, uh, poverty, this as excuse they keep the machine or they try to keep the machine, the economic machine in the old style. Uh, and the big challenge he had was exactly to, to transform the economy of the country, uh, increasing competition, opening the economy. Uh, so we saw the same thing happening, uh, even in Germany, uh, or even in, 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 with the British, when the Labour Party, after 30, 40 years of political hegemony, uh, the island was sinking. Uh, the island was sinking. And then Margaret Thatcher uh, refreshed the whole, the whole uh, British experiment and, 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 and made Britain great again. Let's, let's copy Trump, <laughs> just as a joke. Uh, but the British survived 
when they renewed their faith on markets. Uh, same thing happened with Reagan. When the US was lost, going to double digit inflation, stagnation, a mess, a complete mess. Reagan came and again renewed the faith on economic uh, freedom. So we saw also Chile recently, guys from Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago school, Chicago boys. These guys went to Chile. Uh, it is not, the, they had nothing to do with the, the, the dictatorship itself. So Friedman went to China and Friedman went to Chile and both renewed their faith on markets. The, 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 of course, the Chinese has, had no faith whatsoever, but they began experimenting and it worked. There are two Chinas. One, the official China contracting uh, excess credit, a mess, inefficient state companies is going down. And then there is the there is a recent book by another noble from Chicago, Ronald Coase, how China became capitalist. And he describes the experiment. The Chinese gave up trying to fix the old system. They just create a new one. It was too lousy to fix. It was not fixable anymore. So the state companies were a lousy thing. They were losing competitives. They were not working. So they created the, the, the new China uh, making uh, Shanghai became a wonderful architectural experiment representing uh, the, the, the vigor uh, of the market economy, of the Chinese markets. Uh, meanwhile, Peking uh, became the symbol of the old China with beautiful monuments and all that thing, but wealth was created in the free areas. So just to, to put the, the problem today in the world, it's a very important understanding. Uh, 3.7 billion people, Asians, they are the widows of socialism. The Asians, the Chinese, 1.5 billion Chinese, uh, 200 million uh, Indonesians, uh, 1.3 billion Indians from India, uh, all the people from uh, Hungary, from Poland, from uh, West, from from East Ger East uh, East uh, Europe. So I call them the Eurasians, the Eurasians, uh, East Europe and Asia. These people, 3.7 people, 3.7 billion people. They're getting out of poverty in the last 30 years, all of them. They abandoned socialism gradually. Of course, some few of them still have a, a totalitarian regime, but their economies are jumping into global markets. So they have free economic areas that don't pay tax, don't have social security, have free mobility of labor. So people, 600 million Chinese, got out of the rural poverty under socialism and they jumped in the free economic areas. And from there, they jumped into global trade. This, has, this is Adam Smith 101. And they are getting out of poverty through the markets. Meanwhile, the Western world is in doubt about their very own sources of wealth, very own sources of freedom. So what we see now is that because 3.7 billion Eurasians getting out of poverty, getting out of socialism, getting out of dirigist economies, when these people jump into global markets, they create an enormous problem in the Western world, which is uh, they are competing with us. And we don't understand very well what is going on. And Europe, which was entirely social democrat dominated, politics in Europe is like in Brazil. That's why I say we, we inherited the same cultural brand, the same variant of the Enlightenment, which is the, the socialist one. So they're in shock. That's why you had the Brexit. That's why uh, you had uh, 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 
all over Europe, uh, 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 Macron won the election exactly uh, fighting against the socialists. So there was a shock in Europe. Same thing happened in the US. There was a shock. Trump is the answer uh, to the claim of the people who were not understanding what was going on. What the hell is going on in the world? Why are our incomes not growing anymore? Why, why Europe suffered from Eury sclerosis? Uh, the, the continent is not growing because it was entirely dominated by social democrats. So they lost their way to wealth. They, they are basically conservatives, socialist conservatives. It's an, it was a political alliance. They dominated Europe for 30 years. Socialists in one hand and conserving socialism or social democratic systems. So they, there's no, they suffered from eurosclerosis. Uh, they, 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 and now they became uh, 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 victims of these stagnant economies and corrupted political systems because there, there are a lot of corruption there too. Uh, wherever there is a lot of government intervention, there's a lot of corruption. So the candidate, the favorite, well, let's not, now I'm a public officer. I cannot talk about certain issues anymore. I cannot but tell. But minister. Uh, so minister. The, West, the Western world is under shock. So we are in decay because we are doubting our very own principles that order uh, uh, regions of the world are adopting. First were the Japanese that jumped into global markets, but they were small. They were not big enough to make a noise when they jumped into the swimming pool. But then South Korea jumped, and also they escaped from poverty. Uh, and then Hong Kong has jumped, a small city, no problem. But then China jumped into global markets. So when China jumped in the swimming pool, it's water all over. And then there is the reaction. People here in the Western world are saying, well, the Chinese are stealing jobs all over. Oh, the Chinese are out competing us because they don't have social security. They don't have taxes on labor. They don't have taxes in general. So uh, should, should we, what should we do now? So this is the moment of doubt of the Western world. And we Brazilians are reassuring that we lost uh, the first industrial revolution. We lost all this globalization integration that happened in the last 30 years. Uh, we used it to be the fastest growing economy in the world for two, three, four decades. Brazil was growing 7.3% average, faster than Japan, faster than China, faster than Germany, the US. And then we began decelerating. We closed our political system and then we closed our economy and then we stopped absorbing. Brazil is the first largest pool of Japanese out of Japan. Brazil is the second largest pool of Italians out of Italy. The third largest pool of Germans out of Germany. So we used to absorb people, grow fast enough when we were not regulated, when we were uh, uh, not a statized economy. We used to grow seven point something percent a year and people from all over the world escaping from war. Van Hatten is not a typical Brazilian surname. So your ancestors came from Europe. The Netherlands, yes, Netherlands. the Netherlands. So and Germany, so yeah, so Netherlands, Germans, Japanese, everybody coming to Brazil, Brazil growing 7.3% a year, two, three, four decades in a row. And then we statized the whole economy, we closed the political system, and then we open again our glass knot, but not our perestroika. And then Brazil, even opening the economy, even having uh, 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 an attempt to transform a Hobbesian state. Thomas Hobbes, absolute state, power, centralized. We tried to make a Russonian state, will of the people, trying to send money to poor people all over, but without really opening the economy, 
and adopting a market economy institutional framework. So we went to hyperinflation, we went to, uh, to, to uh, moratoria, and we stagnated the economy, we corrupted the political system, and that's where we are now. That's where we are now. Let, so let, we, let me, yes. Let, let me let me from this also combining several questions that are coming in because you're you're, you're making a, a very broad and uh, uh, excellent an analysis. Uh, many questions come here uh, in in the following sense, asking uh, us, but how is it possible to reverse all this uh, uh, in Latin America to make Brazil um, uh, a more liberal country when there is such faith in the state in Latin America? It is true. The main challenge is this. If people can't get jobs through a market economy, they ask for help through a state-driven uh, economy. So because we never, we never uh, got out of, the, well, we never got out of this trap. When we were young enough and not, uh, it's interesting because uh, when we knew less, we were growing more because we were naive. We absorbed everybody. We, we were a mess. And a mess, a market mess grows faster than an organized, uh, uh, politically closed system. So uh, the, the, the only exception which stands, which looks like is China. I think we don't know enough of China. My, my understanding is the official China is collapsing. It's collapsing. There are cities, the, the collapse of planning is, is, is visible. There are cities of, built for 300,000 people, 400,000 people, there's nobody living there. So there's a lot of credit given by official banks that went bust. Uh, so the official China, probably, that's why they usually reported 16% growth a year, then 14%, then 10%, then 6%. So the thing is going down. It's not going up, it's not new. Coronavirus is just, uh, the the, the uh, recent phenomenon, but the thing was going down uh, in terms of growth rate. Uh, and but there is a very if you read Coe's and why how the Chinese became a capitalist, you see that there was a new China, a new China is growing very fast with market dynamics, and the old China was collapsing. The state-driven China was collapsing. Uh, so I don't think we know enough of China to conclude anything at the moment. Uh, like the Chinese used to say, when you ask them about the French Revolution, they say, well, it's a very recent phenomenon. We can't understand it yet. It's just 200 years old, 300 years old, so it's very recent. So I could say the same of China. It's very recent. We don't know yet enough. We'll know in the future. Uh, uh, but I, I don't believe in miracles. I think that when you, when you uh, have uh, uh, a closed system, you have a huge savings ratio. You save a lot, so you invest a lot. You lose a lot of money. You do a lot of stupid things, but still you grow a lot because people are uh, poor uh, and you, have, you extract their value of labor and you save a lot and you keep launching uh, new programs and new investment programs but you don't have decentralized intelligence. So in the future, for lack of a market intelligence or a decentralized political system, you face problems ahead. So, uh, so probably let's see even, well, there are things I cannot say, but uh, they, they changed their political rules internally. Um, uh, they used to change uh, presidents every uh, six years or seven years, they're not renewing it. Well, if things are going very well, you don't change rules, you keep rules. So probably we don't know exactly what is going on down there. And, yeah. and, 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 and more than that, we are friends with China. Uh, China, China is a, uh, importing a lot from Brazil. The Americans danced with the Chinese for 30 years in a row, 35 years. It's not just because they're fighting now that we will have a problem with them at all. We are, we are exporting a lot to China. Uh, for every $1 we are exporting to the US, we are exporting $3 to China. So our exports this year, in spite of the disease, are growing, are growing. Brazil is exporting 
Uh, the same thing we exported last year, this year. We didn't feel, uh, because the US imported less, Europe imported less, South America imported less, but the Chinese ex imported more. Uh, what was a curse, because Brazil did not integrate to global uh, value chains, uh, it became a blessing now, because every, the Chinese need protein, they need to eat. And, and we are exporters of commodities and minerals, everything they need, we are exporting to them. So uh, we missed not integrating our economy into global economies, but now we are suffering less than the integrated value chains. Uh, so that's where we are, that's why we are saying we are ready to begin integrating because we are late. But being late now at the moment, uh, saved us from this breaking of global value chains. Yeah, and Minister, and, and, and how about we, we have just five to 10 minutes more left and, and uh, thank you very much again for your time. And, and before moving to the, to, to the last question, I want to say that it's, it's really beautiful to see how much hope you inspire in people here at, the, at our chat uh, of our webinar at Zoom webinar, many people here praising the fact that you are now the Minister of Economics and that you're uh, advocating for so many reforms in Brazil. Uh, however, we know that uh, Marxist thought has a very strong grip in Brazil through uh, uh, categories and in, in, in the intellectual life. Well, we see Acton Institute too, that, that is an institute that promotes the ideas of free markets based on moral values, right? And, uh, and we know also that there are many uh, intellectuals that advocate for Marxism, even, for instance, in, in churches through the uh, liberation theology, just to give you an example. And this happens also in intellectual life, in universities, in the academy, and so on. So how do you explain this grip in, in Brazil and in Latin America, but also in the world, and how to change that? Well, I think that linking it all together, when you began asking me how I became a liberal, uh, I think institutes like Acton are what we need here more and more. Because I went through the classic, I couldn't be better training than at Chicago. We had lots of wonderful people there. And still when I left there, uh, I got a lot of messages, liberal messages, true. Uh, but you know, you maybe we need more reading of history, of experiences of other people. It, it, it's just not the technical thing. The technical thing is at the same time, uh, you become a great specialist. But at the same time, it's like you became a neurologist. You, you, you understand everything about the brains, you can simulate everything, but you don't know pretty much in what intellectual environment you are living. And then as you expand your reading to adjacent uh, uh, areas of knowledge, exactly like Popper uh, suggested, then you understand even why you can afford to be so technical. It's because it is already a free society. So if you were in the US, uh, freedom is already everywhere. So you can specialize and still be protected by the institutional inheritance of giants of the past, like the British constitutionalist, like Lord Acton himself, like uh, von Mises, like Hayek, like all these people. So when I came uh, to Brazil and start fighting this environment, it was like that already. It's not new, this thing that the university is being taken by socialists. It's nothing new at all. The good news is now we have at least 10%, 15%, 20% of this space. We used to have zero. We used to have zero space. So don't feel threatened or frightened or, uh, or uh, discouraged by that. Because uh, when I was your age, our space was zero, 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 literally. So I discovered myself in this knowledge trap later. Of course, I read something 
but very technical on Hayek, the use of knowledge in society. A defense, for instance, in Chicago, the defense of uh, the price system, how the price system works. But it was too little. When you read the Constitution of Liberty, Law, Order, and Legislation, uh, when you begin reading his books and then Mises and all these guys, uh, and then you go to, 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 and then one thing pulls the other. Then you go to the Austrians, then you go uh, to, uh, to Tocqueville. And then when you begin reading this, uh, then you understand uh, uh, that the intellectual, that's why when you ask me, what is the obstacle? Is it law? No, law is an application of an intellectual perception of the world. Economics itself, uh, pretending to be a science, is a social science. So it is not an exact science. So using all these uh, mathematical apparatus that I learned is beautiful, but at the same time, it is a trap. It locks you in an abstract space. And we are living in a very real environment, political environment. So the liberal economists, the, the classic economists, not the liberal, the classical economists, Ricardo, Ricardo uh, was a political economist. It was not why our generation thinks of economic policy. The old generation, the classic guys like Ricardo, and then, what is Marx? in economics, a minor post Ricardian. That's what Karl Marx is. He's a minor post Ricardian. So he's a great preacher. He's a very uh, successful revolutionary thinker. He's a great socialist, uh, so, uh, sociologist, uh, which was founded later, the profession, but he was already running uh, for the field. Uh, but as an economist, he's poor. He's very poor. He's a minor post ricardian with a very wrong intellectual framework, the labor value theory. So he's not a scientist at all. So we, we never calculated the influence that he could have. When we studied economics or social science, Marx was a minor reference as a post ricardian Minor, minor. Not... Not if, if you ask Paul Summers, what is the most important or what is the mind that influenced you most? He would say, oh, Joseph Schumpeter. Then you ask to Keynes, which is the, what is the economist that influenced you most? Well, I'm giving you facts. It's not, it's not guesses, it's facts. I studied all these guys and I know. So if you ask Paul Summers, what is your reference? He says, oh, Joseph Schumpeter. Then you ask to, uh, you ask John Maynard Keynes, he would say, Ricardo, David Ricardo. None of the great big ones said Marx. Probably one, which is interesting. Uh, probably Schumpeter himself said that he admired Marx. Uh, uh, but Schumpeter was not the main core of the profession either. He just became famous. He made a lot of wrong prophecies. For instance, he prophesied the end of capitalism and the triumph of the resist economies. It was a complete failure. It was a complete failure. Uh, so he became famous for innovation and disruptive, uh, creative, dis his admiration for capitalism. By the way, Marx had a huge admiration. If you read the manifesto, he says, well, the, the, the capitalism built and, 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 and the bourgeois society, they, they build wonderful things. They, go, they got the cathedrals, uh, the pyramids, uh, things more beautiful than Gothic cathedrals, than the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, he had a huge respect for capitalism. Not the socialists, not the Marxists, but Marx himself had a huge respect for what capitalism had achieved. And when you read Mises, he had a huge respect for the errors of socialists. He said, listen, don't ever underestimate the intellectual power, uh, the intellectual influence of these guys. They are wrong. Technically, they are wrong. They don't understand how markets work but never underestimate their impact. You just go through human action, or I, I, I don't think, 
I think it's also a quote of this, the, the fatal, the fatal uh, conceit. Uh, I think that Hayek, in the opening of the fatal conceit, quotes Mises on human actions saying, uh, uh, don't underestimate socialism. They are conquering minds all over the world. Uh, it's a huge intellectual error, but they captured hurts of people. Uh, do you know what the socialists did? They killed God, they killed God, and they have stolen the flagship, the flag of fraternity. So they killed religions. Uh, fraternity has been with us. Fraternity cooperation has been with us. It is as old, probably older than markets. Fraternity is older than markets. Before, we were still walking through the African savannas and we were already cooperating and we, were, we already had fraternity. Wow. Then, then we discovered markets as a tool for freedom, for human achievement, human accomplishment, and all these things. We discovered markets after fraternity. And we liberals, intellectuals, forgot this. So barbarians kill religions, have stolen the flag of fraternity, and then they control the political spectrum for a hundred years. This is what happened with us liberals. We just forgot to celebrate fraternity and the market system as a cooperation mechanism. Instead of understanding the market system as a beautiful, wonderful cooperation mechanism, we emphasize it competition. Competition is a second order, is a second order uh, 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 phenomenon. The first order is how do we cooperate? We cooperate organizing ourselves into teams and then we compete for prosperity. But it's a second order phenomenon. The first order is cooperation. So the socialists intellectually uh, never understood the markets and we forgot fraternity. So when we forgot that, they stole the flag and they dominate politics. And now we're back on track. Now we are back. Now we are back. Minister, I have to inform Unfortunately, we are out of time. We have to finish, but with your uh, beautiful last words, and I want to give you a, a, a minute to conclude and and, uh, and and give some some more because you gave so many some more words of hope and optimism for Brazilians and every freedom fighter around the world. So you have uh, for your concluding uh, remarks a last minute. Thank you so much for participating, Minister Gaddis. Well, I think we'll go through this first big wave, which is the disease. Uh, it is a terrible disease. And then that's why cooperation, fraternity, and everything that we uh, have talked about is very important. We are the human species. We make mistakes, intellectual mistakes. We, we should not fight over them. Uh, we should argue. We should argue about them. Uh, democracies don't like wars. People who trade don't like wars. Uh, so there is some hope ahead because even the totalitarians, totalitarians of today thrive on trade, which means that we should have hopes. Uh, Milton Friedman himself talking about this said, listen, whoever trades does not like wars. Who, who wants war? Whoever is collapsing whoever is not trading. So uh, when I see uh, 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 this big wave we are fighting against, which is the disease, uh, we will go through this with the sense of cooperation, of preserving the human species. Uh, and uh, then we have the second big wave, which is the leftover of the first shock, which is exactly we, paralyze it partially our economies and we provoke a self-inflicted uh, recession. 
which could transform itself in a depression if we don't fight it uh, uh, properly. So I think Brazil uh, will go through the first one, and I think the world will go through. But I'm, 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 I'm striving and, and fighting uh, for here in Brazil so that we could uh, go through the first wave. Uh, but instead of just taking care of our health, we are promoting reforms. So the next, we, we paralyzed our structural reforms program. For 90 days, we launched very uh, uh, ambitious um, layers of cooperation for uh, the poorest uh, people, the most vulnerable people, I, uh, 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 old people. We spend twice as much as the emerging countries and 10% more than the average of the advanced countries in these emergency programs. So now we are finishing the emergency programs and we are getting back to our reforms. And in the next 60, 90 days, we will accelerate with the help of Mr. Van Hyde, Van Hatten, a bright young congressman in Brazil who has been voting with us all the way. The, the last year and a half, he voted for social security, for sharing with states and municipalities the funds. He's a bright young man, liberal. He's, he'll be the president of our, uh, our house in the next five, 10 years, certainly, for his consistent work, his bright work, his capacity to mobilize people, his bright, brilliant discourses in the Congress. So with the help of these guys, a young generation that is coming, uh, we will keep reforming the country. We will keep reforming the country in a liberal direction. So, uh, and then we think we'll go through the second big wave, which is the economic distress caused and brought about by the disease. So all of you okay. guys, take care of your health. Good health for all of you. Keep the energy. And Lord Acton has never been so contemporaneous. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Minister Paulo Guedes. I'm humbled by your words, and I want to share them with every freedom fighter in Brazil, with every participant in the world that is watching this uh, interview live and those who will watch it later on because it will be uh, accessible to everybody on Acton platforms. And I want to uh, conclude with, uh, with words from a participant here in the chat. If they could be mind the words. Yeah. What a brilliant mind. Paulo Guedes gives me hope for a better and brighter future in Brazil. Thank you very and, much, Minister Paulo and Guedes. Re and remember our, our, our friend, old friend, Mrs. Be kind to socialists. They're just mistaken. They don't understand right. what they're doing. That's right. We, we have to be kind to everybody in the world, and we have always to uh, be very sensitive about the social situation. And... Uh, fighting for free markets around the world, moral values for a virtuous society. Thank you very much, Minister Paulo Guedes. Thank, Thank you, you all for watching. Bye.